Welcome to The Book Show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Tracy Kidder has won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. His books include Mountains Beyond Mountains, The Soul of a New Machine, House, and A Truck Full of Money. His new book, Rough Sleepers, Dr. Jim O'Connell's urgent mission to bring healing to homeless people, tells the story of Dr. Jim O'Connell, a gifted man who invented ways to create a community of care for a city's unhoused population, including those who sleep on the streets, the rough sleepers. Much as he did with Paul Farmer in Mountains Beyond Mountains, Kidder explores how a small but dedicated group of people have changed countless lives by facing one of society's most difficult problems instead of looking away. Tracy Kidder invited us to his home in central Massachusetts for a two-episode book show. This week, we discuss the book. Next week, we'll meet Dr. O'Connell. Tracy Kidder, it's always a great pleasure to talk about your work. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Joe. It's nice to see you again after all these years. This, this one took me six years, I think. My understanding is you were working on something else. Uh, you were interested in the issue of, of homelessness, but, but you were following somebody else around, and then you found this guy. That's true. I was uh, writing about a guy named Paul English, who uh, actually is the central figure in that book of mine called The Truck Full of Money. Paul uh, is the founder of Kayak, and he, he, was, he had always been interested in homelessness in Boston, his native city. And he had found his way to, to Jim. He wanted to learn more about it. People in the town said, well, you've got to go meet Jim O'Connell. Jim took him out on the outreach van. There's a, there are two vans that go out every night from the Pine Street Inn in Boston uh, and th that circle through the city looking for rough sleepers, basically. It's 24-7, all, all 12 months a year. So we went out, and I was, um, I was amazed. I mean, first of all, I think like many Americans, I'd often performed that sleight of mind that allows you not to see really the, the poorest people in your city lying in doorways, sitting on park benches. I, I suddenly, I was being presented with a world hidden in plain sight, a, a, a world that really oughtn't, oughtn't to exist. But it was, um, it was fun. I mean, fun because the relations between this doctor and these people, he was, it was as if he were making house calls because he knew where they all would be. They, they were so warm. They were, they were clearly friends. And it was... Um, I was just puzzled. I was puzzled, amazed, fascinated by that, and of course I was aware that this was a, a big national problem, and so I came back uh, some time later to go out with him alone on the van. And actually, my book begins there, with that scene of uh, finding a guy on, a, on an abandoned loading dock under a bunch of blankets. A kind of amusing scene to me. And, and from then on, you know, I, I thought about it and talked with Jim and. I guess he got permission to let me into the lives. Uh, 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 the, the, the organization is called Boston, the, the, a brick wall of a name, the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. Jim calls it the program, most people do. It's a huge organization now. I mean, it's 400 employees roughly with 30 clinics, uh, and, and clinics in every one of the shelters in Boston, which has a lot of shelters. Two really huge clinics, w one of which is affiliated with Mass General Hospital, the other with the Boston Medical Center, so it has this extraordinary web of services for homeless people. They can specialty care in those places. It also has, I mean, among many other things, a 104-bed respite hospital, which is a gem of a place, a place where a homeless person can go and, you know, recover from surgery or just to get some a break from the streets or, you know, it's just for survival. I, I love that place. And then they also have these specialized teams, a team a team that has done extraordinary work with homeless people with AIDS and, and hepatitis C, a, a team that helps transgender people who are really, really endangered outside. Um, and the one, the team that I was fascinated with that Jim was the captain of is the street team. Jim's the president of the organization, the founding phys physician. In these latter days of his career, he, this is the, his favorite thing, is to work with those people who refused to go inside um, for various reasons. 
And that is where that British term comes from, rough sleepers, or the people who refuse to, to go into a shelter. Yeah, it's a 19th century term, I think, uh, sleeping in the rough, although um, Jim's wife, Jill, did some research at one point and found that there, there, there seems to be an approximation of the term in Virgil, in the Aeneid, <laughs> referring to soldiers who are sleeping outside. But it's sleeping in the rough, you know, and, and it means uh, maybe sleeping out just right outside on a park bench or maybe in, maybe inside in the shelter of an ATM parlor or even had one patient who had lived in a, a rented storage locker. You talk about that opening scene in the book, and it is very amusing because it's uh, you just it's this mound of blankets, and then and then um, I think somebody says something to the person, the person says "f off," and and then all of a sudden Jim comes in, yeah. and there's just this this explosion of activity, and out comes this guy who wants to talk to Jim. Yeah, is it it, it was it, the, the, one of the really the, the van drivers who are great guys went up and said, you know. We haven't seen you in a long time. They knew who it was. And, and to the blankets, I was kind of surprised. He's talking to blankets. And then the blankets talked back. And they said something pretty vulgar to the effect of get, get away, get out, go away. And then Jim came up to the blankets and, and knelt down beside him and said, hey, you know, um, I haven't seen you in a long time. I uh, just want to make sure you're all right. And then the, it was like an earthquake in the blankets. The, the explosion, this head came out bright, had tousled hair. And, you know, just saying, how the... F are you, Jim? And they talked then for about half an hour. It was pretty interesting. It wasn't that wasn't that uncommon a, a sort of thing, you know. Not uncommon for him, and not uncommon for the patients. But I think for us to read about that, to know that there is someone who has that kind of relationship with the people who regularly are on the streets. Yeah, it is. That's I think it's very unusual. I mean, there are a number of people in the in this country who are doing similar work. Um, some of them doctors, many of them doctors, and, and in various professions. It's not as though this is unique. I think Boston may have the best of these, of these home health care for the homeless programs. These were first started back in the uh, in the in the 80s, um, right when the when the numbers of homeless exploded. What what most people call the modern age of homelessness in America, uh, and it had to do with all sorts of a concatenation of forces, one of which. Was was Ronald Reagan's presidency? I mean, their their cost cutting measures. Although I, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting into the weeds here, Joe. But it is important to remember that during his entire presidency, both terms, he never had control of the whole Congress, or he may have for one for two years. I can't remember, but you know, so he wasn't doing this all by himself. You you do say that in the book that there are there's fault on both sides politically on on this problem as it was exploding, but it was Ronald Reagan even at the end of the term who said, well, I don't know why these people can't find a job. There's plenty of ads in the newspaper. Oh yeah, and and in effect, he equated shelters with homes, which is which is really ridiculous, of course. But this is roughly when Jim began his career uh, with a Robert this Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Pew Charitable Trust teamed up to offer an initial I think it was 16 or 17 cities these grants to run four-year programs. And I think the thought really was then this is a, this is a temporary problem that will be all, it'll be all fixed by the end. I mean, the, the impetus partly for it was that none of these people had doctors of their own and they were clogging emergency rooms and their, I don't think anyone was too worried about their health. Um, what Jim discovered in his first years out there was a epidemic of, of neglect. I mean, something that approximated the kind of medicine you'd probably be practicing in a country that had just suffered from a civil war or an earthquake. And it, it seems in, in my reading of the book that at the beginning, during the start of his program and the work, that the AIDS crisis was just coming really into to, to full fruition. Yeah. But then also by the end and now, it's opioid addiction, drug addiction, and that's the, the scourge that is yeah. being dealt with on the streets. Yeah, that is. I, I think it's a, a, a mistake and, and unfair to think of that as simply a problem of homeless people. It is often, I mean, this horrible scourge is often the cause of homelessness, I think. And it's not to say that people on the streets don't abuse a lot of substances. I mean, if I were living on the streets, Joe, I'd take, find, I'd take everything I could find. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. I, I, I say that vicariously, but I, I, I'm sure it is. And I spent a lot of time with patients of Jim's, enough to know that it is just that thing. But yes, this is one of the scourges 
that's out there and one of the things they have to deal with. But it is still, I don't know, I haven't seen the most current causes of death, but the deaths, the death rates suffered by homeless people who, who tend to live in shelters, who are chronically homeless but living in, in shelters, it's approximately four times that of the general public, of their age mates in the general public. For rough sleepers, it's something like 10 times. Uh, what do they die of? I mean, they don't just die of drug overdoses. Sometimes it's alcohol, long term, but it's it's often it's more 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 often cancer than anything else. I believe it used always used to be that. The fentanyl epidemic uh, has maybe perhaps begun to change that. I'm not sure, but that stuff is just lethal, of course. Tracy Kidder is our guest. The name of the new book is Rough Sleepers, Dr. Jim O'Connell's Urgent Mission to Bring Healing to uh, Homeless People. There is a character throughout the book that really anchors the book by the name of Tony. Tony is, uh, I'll let you describe him, but he's a just an outsized, uh, uh, bigger-than-life figure. But I, I think of when you're talking about the drug issue, it's that's constantly a struggle. Yes, when, when he showed up on on the shores of the street team, uh, he had he was just out of he'd been out of prison for about a year. He'd been he'd been in prison for nearly twenty years. I think it was eighteen, but they always round up, as someone said to me. And uh, uh, he was a, right immediately looking for some help for pain from Jim, and Jim helped him with that. Not not by giving him he gave him some he he, he was using Suboxone, which is a actually a a way to wean people from heroin. Anyway, uh, he became a regular. Jim was very kind to him. Um, Jim figured, if I don't you know, help this guy now, Jim gave up a whole evening and got home awfully late in order to help him go and get his prescription filled. He did it because he figured if he didn't do that, the guy would never come back. Therefore, the, the whole thing was therapeutic because he needed to come back. And he started coming back and became a, a, a regular. And I think... My sense of this man is that he was desperate for a, a purpose in life. He was actually very, very smart, not well-educated. I mean, he'd been a spectacular elementary school student, but he never bothered with high school. He could have been a great athlete. He was very large and very fit. I mean, and, I, you know, he had all kinds of stories about how he'd helped all kinds of people in prison. I sort of thought, oh, yeah, right. But then I found two different people who had, had, different, who had been in prison with him. And they said, oh, yeah, that's, that's true, you know. And I was quite moved by that. But one of the things he started to do was to try to make himself Jim's unofficial lieutenant and protect the weakest people out on the streets. And I know he did that because I saw it happen. And it was quite moving. I mean, he, and he would take care of certain people who were really vulnerable. Um, he, and I say he was smart. He told me one day that he really loved art, or as he put it, at I love art. <laughs> Had a great Boston accent. And and uh, I said, well, have you ever been to the Museum of Fine Arts? And he kid had grown up in Boston. He'd never even been in that neighborhood, which is, I gather, not, not always that, that uncommon. You know, it's a provincial city. I took him there, and Franny, my wife, is a, is a painter and an art historian, and she took him on as a student. And, you know, it's just a sort of a lark, but he really wanted to do it. And he was astonishing. An astonishing student. He started out saying, you know, over I think it was in front of a Helen Frankenthaler p- paintings that, oh yeah, you, you know, a kid could do this, you know, Frankenstein, you know, for Frankenthaler, that stuff. And then he got serious. She she just ignored that, you know, as if he were her, you know, high school student, and said, yeah, but look at this and look at this. And pretty soon he was pointing out things to her. And they, it, I'm listening to him. It's like, hey, they're going to the museum together. And at one point during the whole thing. Uh, Jim joined. Joined the, the Jim O'Connell joined the tr- troop a little later on. Jim was became tremendously fond of this guy. I should add, but what I what I want to get at is right near the end, he made an observation about a painting that really only an art historian would be expected to make, and it astonished Franny. He'd seen something in the in a painting by a German, not con- quite contemporary, but re- you know, relatively modern painting. Something in a hand, and and he said to Fran, "Doesn't that look like the uh, the David?" And Fran, he said, I-, "I was thinking that." And then, you know, we started in on him. He said, "Joe, you must have studied art." He said, "I read books. I don't did I study art? No." I said, "Look." Michelangelo, the Colosseum. He said, I'm Italian. <laughs> and, and it was, I don't know, the whole thing. And I remember this so clearly. We left. He, he had a bad foot. We decided to 
get him set up for the night in a hotel or something. Then, and we put him in a cab, Jim and I. And and I remember Jim saying, as the cab drove off, just he's saying, I, I I just can't help thinking what he could have been. And you know, and I would say that about almost every one of J- Jim's patients whom I met. I mean, they all had v- varying problems. There were all, there were always reasons why they were there, out there. That was the the great. The great astonishing revelation that ought to have been obvious to me from the first. These were people just like you and me. They're, 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 not, they're not some special species. Homelessness is not a, a human trait. It's a condition that you know people fall into and that really shouldn't exist at all, in the, obviously, in the world's richest country. But, but when you got to know them, they were, they were wonderful. I mean, many of them. And, and then if you started to hear their stories and you began to understand... I mean, I heard some stories that were, uh, isn't, I'm not talking about a bad childhood, I'm talking about horrifying stuff. And this guy, Tony, had that sort of hidden back there too. But Which, yeah, comes out in the book and it's, uh, it's, it's stunning. Rough Sleepers is the name of the new book. Tracy Kidder is the author. It's published by Random House. When you were talking about Tony and and the the protection that he would have over the other patients of Doctor O uh, Doctor O'Connell's, but he was really protecting Doctor O'Connell too. Well, he thought he was. Yeah, he thought, he told other uh, some of the other patients who he you know thought were a little sketchy that he was he was actually uh, Jim's uh, great nephew, which was sort of another thing. And now. One, 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 one person told me this, one of the patients, or really not a patient, she's a, a member of the board, but formerly homeless, and she had her doubts about this guy. She said, you know, that's, he's just making up stuff, showing off. But Jim was absolutely convinced, no, that's not what was going on. He just wanted anybody to know that if they messed with him, they'd have to answer to, to Tony. You know, <laughs> That if anyone messed with Jim, they'd answer to him. You know, you know and he was trying to help Jim. Uh, I, I think he was helpful on, on occasion. He was also practically a full-time job from time to time. Right. And and I assume, I mean, that's the danger of, of what happens, it seems, when someone like Dr. O'Connell in the sense that uh, here was a guy that would, would have money in his, in his pocket and would hand it out, that, that once you get that reputation, you're, you, a lot of people are going to come around. That's a whole other issue about giving money to homeless people. I think that you know, there are people who think it's a bad thing to do because you never know what they might buy with it that might hurt them. My my feeling about that is that that's really kind of kind of too easy because it it lets you it lets you walk away thinking you've done a good deed when the, when you haven't done anything at all. Well, am I am I right that his reasoning and we can talk to him about this, but am I right that his reasoning was that also it would help get people to Mass General, get them to the clinic, and get them back, and 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 help, uh, and and help ensure a bond. I think I think it was I it, may, it was that partly I think it was also just something he felt he wanted to do, in order to do, and I think he started it because the woman who pretty much told him how to do his, taught him how to do his job after his residency at Mass General was a as a nurse to the homeless named Barbara McGinnis. And he was saying he was thinking of giving a donation to one of the shelters. And she said, why don't you just give it to your patients? You know, he said, you won't get a tax break, but that, that way you won't, be, you won't be helping the military industrial complex. So anyway, he, uh, I think, he, you know, and he, he didn't have a lot of money then. He was, it was a very low paying job when he started. And he'd give, he'd give out a dollar here or there. And then a little later on, I think he began to notice the program had built its first respite in a place where um, there, were, there was no one to cage money from, uh, just to, to beg money from, and, and no source of income for a lot of the people there. And food trucks would come and feed the staff, and he'd see patients, you know, kind of like little boys at the candy store window, little girls, and he just thought, this isn't right. I feel crappy not doing something. And he thought, well, maybe I should buy them food. But then he also had a, a mentor, a, a, a formerly homeless woman who was actually the head of the board of directors, who said it felt that a gift should be given freely. You don't tell people what you're... You don't go to the person, give them a gift, and then say, this is what you have to do with it. That was her feeling. And I think he bought into that, too. So it's complicated. So much of this is complicated, and it, it seems impossible to even come to terms after reading the book of, of what are solid things that we can do to help eradicate 
homelessness. this homelessness because there are so many facets to it. There are, and it, I mean, it is, it, it is as one of the smartest people who talks about this and one of the most effective people co coming up with part of, of the solution, a woman named Roseanne Haggerty, who has this wonderful organization called C Community Solutions. She says, look, we, it took us a long time, but we suddenly realized homelessness is a symptom and, and, and it's a symptom of, of, of very many things in our society, not just, but including, and maybe first of all, a lack of decent affordable housing, you know, a, a real scarcity now that in, in some places like Boston or New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco. I mean, you know, it's outrageous now, the, the cost of, of housing. I mean, if, 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 as somebody has put it, housing then becomes kind of a game of musical chairs, well, the people who have certain kinds of problems are going to be the ones that are left standing, right? They're going to be left out of the cold. And that, I mean, that's just one way to think of it. There are, there are people who are homeless for only one night, you know, during the course of a year. There are others who are intermittently homeless. There are others who are home, chronically homeless. They're not the largest part of the uh, problem. I, th I forget the exact numbers. I don't think we really ever know any exact numbers about this. That's another complexity, by the way. The, the, all the, the numbers you hear are not accurate, Joe. That's the only, I can't tell you what the accurate ones are, but they're always low. You made a point in the book that I, I was startled by, and I had to read it a couple of times to make sure that I, I had it right. But you talk about the discrepancy between race and the fact that looking at Jim's patients, that there were not as many black patients. And, and and I guess because they they were it was more hidden because they were they were often somewhere else. Well, we don't know. You know, it's kind of they, they, a lot of homelessness is hidden in this country. It is also true. It is true that the his his the percentage of black patients in his patient panel was smaller than you might have expected. Since it does seem, but again, these are very sketchy numbers. That 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 fully forty percent of all homeless people are are black. But I had it on the authority of one of the, of a black, formerly homeless black guy who's on the lovely guy on the board of Boston Healthcare for the homeless. That the way he experienced it was very different from the way the most of these rough sleepers experienced it. He was not outside. He went for a while. He was in a crack house, but more often than not, he was in a relative's apartment or a girlfriend's apartment. He was living on sofas, you know, uh, people's floors. And I think there's probably a very large number. Of I mean, I think most people expect that there's a very large number of people doing that. And there was also some sense that maybe the black community was better at taking care of their own than the white community. Maybe one way to think about that is that if you're, if you're white, you've, you've fallen through an awful lot of safety nets in order to get to the streets, but not quite so many if you're black. And so the people who had fallen into the, the condition of rough, sleeping, of rough sleepers um, really had were really down and out. Really, often didn't ha had no family ties left, and you know. So I, it, it's hard to understand, Joe. I, I mean, I'm I'm just making, you know, I'm, I'm just reciting some of the suppositions, and we don't know any of this for sure. And another fact too is Boston is a city that that has relatively the rough sleepers. It's relatively it's a smaller number compared to larger metropolitan areas, yeah. simply because of the weather. It's partly because of the weather and partly because every single Boston mayor, since Mayor Flynn at least, has said that anyone who wants a, bed, a shelter bed in the city on any given night will, will get one. Um, and I mean, one of, that's one of the things I say about Boston's, and, and Boston has more shelters uh, per capita, I think, than any other place. I'm pretty sure of that. Jim would know. But it also has, most of the shelters are wet. They'll let you come in if you're drunk. And that's different from, from other jurist, other places. So people do use them, and and it um, and so there are a lot fewer rough sleepers, and also because of the weather, as you as you say, <laughs> you know, it's not fun to sleep outside there. You, it, it seems, but you were talking about this early on about the 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 fun of that of of being in the van and being on the street and meeting the uh, of the patients. And, and because of that, and you, as you also alluded to, there's some just horrifying stories within the book. But it seems that, that you and Jim both come out rather hopeful. I'm hopeful. I, I, fun made, it was too small a word, I think. There was something, uh, uh, you know, there's something about uh, seeing 
interesting, deep, rich friendships as an observer that is that actually makes you think of the word like joy, you know. Yeah. I think there was, you know, maybe if you look at it from Jim's point of view, which, which I do a lot in this book, if you think about a guy who was himself extremely gifted, uh, had a hard time finding his profession because so many possibilities were there maybe, uh, and who finally settled on medicine at the age of 30, um, and he went to, he wanted to become. He wanted to go be a, go to the University of Vermont Medical School, but they wouldn't take him because he was too old. They said so. He settled for Harvard, and then he, uh, and then he went and he got his residency at Mass General, um, and he, you know, he 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 loved medicine, and he got conscripted into this job, and he was only going to do it for a year, but I think what part of what he found, I'm I'm speaking for him perhaps out of school, but was that, you know, he's, I'm good at this. I love medicine. And I have now been given as patients the people who needed me more than anyone else in this, in this city, arguably, as a group. And they really appreciate it. And I'm also free because, because you can't practice this kind of medicine if you do it by the, with the current corporate model where efficiency is what counts. and You can only ha spend 10, 15 minutes with a patient. You know, you, you just can't do homelessness medicine that way because you won't have any patients. These are people who've been bruised by the system. Certainly, when he got when he first started, uh, and they, they have to be often coaxed in. You have to be persuaded to receive this this uh, medicine for free. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a up, as he called it once upside down medicine. So so I think there's an underlayment of of you know, I mean it, it, that'd be a pretty good job. There is also that feeling that geez the problem is enormous, and I can't see any one solution to it. Medicine certainly isn't the solution to it. But it's part of what Jim has called a, a potential mosaic of efforts. I mean, health is <laughs> pretty important for everybody. And, and you need housing, and you need the kind of stuff that uh, this community solutions group is trying to do. And you'll need better education, and we'll need to do something about child abuse and substance abuse and, and criminal justice system that basically condemns some kinds of offenders, basically is, it gives them death warrants after they've served their, their sentences, that in the sense that it virtually guarantees that they'll be out on the streets living for a while. Tracy Kidder's new book is Rough Sleepers, Dr. Jim O'Connell's urgent mission to bring healing to homeless people. It is published by Random House. Our conversation will continue next week when we meet Dr. Jim O'Connell. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org. You can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Sarah LaDuke produces our program. Bookmark us for next week.